Hi, everybody. Welcome and happy winter. I am Leslie Esslinger, and I am the Director of Education and Development here at Becker's. Um, I have um, some mood setting background today. Um, so just to kind of get in the mood for our winter series with Holly. This is the second in a series that Holly is doing for us. Uh, some of you might have been here when we did a webinar, the webinar on fall science. And if you were there, you might hear some similar things today to just reiterate the importance of observations and the kinds of techniques you wanna use no matter what season it is when you're doing science activities. But other than that, we have all new material and you'll get lots of uh, fun activities to do to get through this long winter. Holly, if you could take us to the next slide. So a few little details as we always do before we get started. Um, of course, you will get a professional development certificate. We always try to make these attractive for your files, for your walls, wherever you like to have them or house them. So the, these get sent by email to the same address that you registered with. And that happens within uh, 24 to 48 hours. So just check your emails for that. Uh, I also just wanna let you know that once you link on that certificate to download it, that link is available for 30 days. I usually get start getting emails on day 31 to say that, oops, the link is gone. So please, as soon as you get it, try to get it printed. Um, we hope you have questions. We hope we engage you during this session. So you'll have lots to ask Holly. It's Best for us if you ask questions in the question and answer box. Uh, we have Terry on hand, we have Marilyn on hand, uh, Kathy will jump in if we need be. We have our whole team here to, to answer any questions you might have. Um, and we also welcome you to, to chat informally in the chat box where, wherever your comfort lies. But we, we probably will do best to answer your questions in the question answer box. Uh, we will be doing polls during this session. And just to let you know, uh, the polls are just not um, time user uppers. Uh, they're really information that we want to know. We want to know what's working for you. We want to know what resonates with you. So that helps inform us. So thank you in advance for participating in those. Will there be a recording of this session? I'm trying to answer some of the questions that you might be thinking of you want to know. Uh, will there be a recording? Absolutely. And that will be available on our website. Uh, Terry and Marilyn will be putting that link in um, the chat and in the question answer box for you. And um, then of course you wanna know when the next webinar is because next after winter comes spring and I'll be announcing that at the very end of this session. Next slide, please. Ah, so we really wanna do an extra commercial break here while we have so many great people attending this session that we are super excited to have a webinar coming up with Dan Brown. Uh, hopefully you recognize his name. He's a famous um, internationally known author, mostly of, of adult novels, um, mostly known for the Da Vinci Code and many others. And he now is debuting his first children's book, and agreed to do a webinar for Beckers. He's never done this before. And I convinced him that we would be a great audience because I did tell him very, and I honestly believe this, that we have the nicest people that come to our webinars. So uh, February 9th, save the date. It's gonna be four o'clock in the afternoon. We will be promoting it. Next. Oh, my favorite slide about Holly. Now I got to come on camera for this one because Leslie goes rogue every time she introduces me and I want to fact check I, what I she's saying about I'd be very well behaved today. Uh, so <laughs> uh, uh, about Holly. So look at the pictures. She's, <laughs> she's all that and much more. Uh, she's, she's a very experienced and well-educated teacher. She has, has had, had a fantastic career at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. She's also a reading specialist. So she brings literacy and science together. Science is her true love, maybe her first love. I hope her children aren't listening in. They're not listening. It's fine. <laughs> um, and uh, she just is such an enthusiast, en enthusiast 
about all things nature and science and it's very contagious so we we hope you really if you don't know holly um you're going to enjoy today's session and just to let you know more things to look forward to we've partnered with holly to follow up on our kitchen series from last year and we've created these great kitchen activity cards that that are really going to be awesome you'll see them in our 2021 catalog and she's also working on some videos for us so it's all pretty exciting very exciting stuff i was well behaved right you were very well behaved give away time. any of your deep dark secrets none of my deep dark secrets this time so so I'm going to go off camera and I'm turning <laughs> it over to you. All righty. All right, Hello, everybody. everyone. It's winter time. Even if it doesn't feel like winter where you are, it is winter time. So we're going to be talking a lot about um, uh, science as it pertains to sort of doing those, those winter activities. Now, your uh, uh, preschool teachers, you know all of the really cute, wonderful, I'm sorry, all the cute, wonderful crafts that are out there for winter, all the things you can do with cotton balls. What I wanted to do today, though, was to um, sort of push you a little bit outside your comfort zone and uh, try some more inquiry science using the topics of winter and hopefully give you some unique activities to do with your classroom. So really quick, there are the standards. I am sure you're all very familiar with them. The nice thing, the thing I love about science standards for um, preschool is that it's all about the process that's involved in, in, in doing science. And that's my favorite thing, because really, that's what science is all about. The content, eh, that can come. You can read a great book and learn a lot of the content. But the process and the skills involved with science learning, all of these standards address that. And so everything we're going to do today is really focused on getting kids excited about science, exploring the world around them, using their um, sense, their, their five senses and their sense of observation. Um, so the standards, solid for preschool and, 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 and science. So they're there. You can look at them, peruse them at your leisure. All right, so really quick, if you joined me last uh, time, I want to go over sort of my philosophy on science for, for small people. So that'll sort of frame a lot of the activities we're doing today. So it's, like I said, all about skills and loving science. It is not important that uh, kids in preschool know all of the different, the names of the different parts of a tree. That's not important. But what I want them to learn is the experience of observing a tree and, and, and learning about all of those pieces. They don't need to know the names of them. That's not important. We're trying to raise really um, science literate um, citizens here. And the best way to do that is to start in preschool. All right, so the things that you're gonna really focus on in um, early elementary science, making observations. 100%. Now I have taught students all the way up to adults. And I can tell you that basically after kindergarten, people stop talking about their senses, which is a bummer for science education, because it's all about using your senses. For some reason, we assume you should stop doing that after kindergarten. So uh, in preschool, let's solidify that science means making observations and really looking at the world around you. And then asking questions. Now this sometimes gets lost in translation. We're gonna do a, a major inquiry exploration while we're here today. And I'm gonna show you some of the ways you can encourage sort of meaningful scientific questioning from your students. We know preschoolers can ask questions. That's something they can do. But what I want you to start you is start doing is using those questions to sort of form the, that, that love of science. So those are the two main things that we sort of want to focus on in science for um, preschoolers. All the other stuff, we can learn cause and effect by doing science. We can learn following directions by doing science. We can learn order of operations. And of course, finally, that background knowledge acquisition. All of those things will sort of come with it, but really focusing on making observations and asking good questions, that's the sweet spot for preschool um, science education. All right, here's our first poll. This, this question is really telling, okay? So, so Ms. Leslie or whoever is handling our polls for us today, if you could go ahead and push this first one because I wanna know how you feel about mess in your classroom, okay? So we know that classroom's always a little bit messy, but if you've got mess, how does that make you feel? Because a lot of science can be messy. 
So I want to see what everyone's sort of comfort level is with a mess in their classroom. So we're seeing the numbers go up. It's like most of you are pretty comfortable with mess. That makes me really excited because I'm a mess a lot of the times, but the mess also helps you to learn, which is, I think, what a lot of you are showing me here. Fan. And Holly, I'm going to jump in and let people know that we're not sharing these results with, an, with anyone. You can be honest. If yes, you don't like please. mess, it's, it's just between us. <laughs> let it out we're there. Friends. We're all friends here. It's fine. All right. Fantastic. Okay. So while you're finishing up, that's good to know. It's good to know. So I do want to show you my first um, hands-on experiment. Now you, if you're doing a winter uh, lesson in your classroom, you've probably seen across the interwebs uh, ways to sort of melt ice. A lot of people use salt and they have these like really elaborate experiments that use salt to melt ice. And that's a really um, interesting and a great way to learn about sort of those states of matter using salt to melt your ice. But I, I found that it wasn't really sort of preschool friendly. So I wanted to uh, show you a different way of doing those sort of standards uh, salt melting, salt ice melting experiments with sort of a preschool twist. So you can see there that they've got the, I've got the supplies on the screen. At the end of this uh, session, you will have access to the step-by-step -step directions for these, um, uh, all of these activities. So you don't need to worry about writing these things down yet. Just sort of live in the moment and enjoy it. Um, but you'll you'll have access to the supply lists and the step-by-step -step for doing all of them. So I'm gonna, so go ahead, Leslie. You want me to share the results now? Sure, sure, okay, go for so it. Okay, so everybody can see. Yeah, let's see. There we go, all right, good. Very, we, we don't have a lot of uh, haters of mess, which I feel like is pretty in line with most sort of preschool teachers because mess is part of the job, um, but I'm, I'm glad. So I will talk and I see a lot of you are concerned about sort of um, minimizing that mess and make sure making sure it's contained. I will talk about that as I do my experiments as well. All right, so I'm gonna flip cameras so that you can see. So now you're actually seeing a little camera that's right next to me here. And I've got this sort of pot of, looks like sort of just like it's a mess. <laughs> um, what this actually is, is just normal tempera paint that I've added a lot of kosher salt to. Now, um, in the directions for this particular activity, you'll you'll see it's about a half a cup of paint per student. And then I don't give a, um, a an exact measurement for the salt because really it's gonna depend on how watery your paint is. But what you want is to add enough salt that something you stick inside the paint will uh, stick straight up like this. Now, the reason I decided to do this is to give sort of more of a, um, tactile feeling to the, to the salt experiments. So now we've got color involved. It's more of a paste instead of a powder. So you can move it around a little bit better. And let me show you how you're gonna use it on ice. So I'm gonna go back to my camera here. So what I have is just a nice little frozen pack of ice. If you are lucky enough to live somewhere where there's actual ice on the ground or there's snow on the ground, bring this paste outside. It would be amazing to sort of mess around with melting ice with this, um, with this uh, child-friendly paste. So this can be complete free um, exploration. Because what I want to show you is what happens when you add sort of just this sort of paste to the ice here. So you can see I've added two sort of like little, or bring it a little closer for you there, two little globs of this um, paste to the ice. And right away, you're gonna start seeing sort of the, the color from the paint, the pigment from the paint, start to move away from our, um, our little blobs there. So what's happening is we're seeing um, that salt, start to lower the temperature of our ice. And as it, it lowers the freezing temperature of our ice. So as it does that, it no longer freezes at the same temperature as all of the other ice around it. So when you're, um, 
when you're looking at these globs here, you'll start to notice that it's melting along the outside. Now, if you leave it here for five minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes, you'll notice that it'll start to melt even more. The nice thing about it is when you wipe away this paste, you're left with a beautiful sort of carved appearance to the ice. Now, I'm going to push this up here so you can see one um, that I did a little bit earlier and then sort of refroze so you could look at it. The nice thing about this paste is that it stays in place. So it might be a little hard to see on my camera here, but do you see how it's sort of modeled along here? That's where I had paste laying on this ice. It's really tactile because once you remove the paste, you can feel all the little bumps, all the little places where that salt was laying and melting the ice. So much so that you could even sort of roll a little uh, marble down that little thing right there. You can make your own marble runs because it, it does, it sort of carves the ice for you because of sort of the nature of the paste. It's not just salt you're sprinkling on top. It sort of sits because it's in this little paste here. So you can sort of see, even now it's already, I'm gonna move this guy aside so you can take a closer look at it. You can already see how it started to melt the ice, just this little amount of time. So um, it's a really sort of neat tactile way. It's a little more interesting than sort of sprinkling ice on an ice cube. Now, <clears throat> let me come on back here. Oh, there I am. Um, this can be done, like I said, it can be done completely outside. So it's a, it's a little less messy. Um, you can change the experiment. You can try to add more salt. You can add uh, different kinds of salt. I use kosher salt. You could try it with table salt. Um, the, the nice thing about it though, is that it, it almost starts to work immediately, uh, which is great for preschool. <laughs> it's really good that you can see the effects of the paste uh, very, very quickly. And it's um, obvious. So if you were just to sprinkle salt on an ice cube, of course it would start to, to melt that ice cube. But with the paste here, it kind of stays where, it, where you laid it so that um, as it starts to melt, you can see it around the edges very, very clearly. And then it leaves a very obvious place where the salt was um, uh, when you laid it down there in the first place. So let me, let's talk a little bit about, um, whoops, why this experiment works, okay? Because your teachers, teachers are some of the best uh, learners out there. So while I'm letting my, my pace sort of sit there and um, get a little more model, and I'll show you what it looks like after a, a few more minutes. Um, so here's the deal. Salt doesn't really melt ice. It's kind of tricky. I know we salt the roads when it's getting really icy out. But like I mentioned a little bit earl earlier, salt actually just lowers the freezing temperature of water. So if it would have uh, been freezing at this level, now it takes this level to freeze. Okay, so this temperature is now where it freezes. So it won't freeze in sort of the, the, the normal way that ice would. So as the salt dissolves into our water, um, that water now doesn't freeze anymore. And then it starts to melt more. And then it starts to melt more. And then it starts to melt more. And it lowers the temperature, uh, the freezing temperature of all of the water. So it keeps it from sort of icing up again. Um, and that's uh, sort of a, a, this little diagram here I thought was really helpful because the salt just sort of gets in there and it stops the water from making those ice crystals the way that they would need to, to make snow or to make ice. Okay. Let's check in on our, um, our paste here. Let's see what it looks like. So we switch back to it. You can see the spot where the um, uh, paste was before. If I move this paste now, it's even deeper. Oops, there we go. It's an even deeper hole. In just that little bit amount of time, you can see the, de the difference between where the salt was sitting and where the salt's not. Now, again, there's a lots and lots and lots of experiments out there using salt to uh, melt ice. But I thought that we would definitely wanna look for a way that's a little bit more sort of preschool or early childhood friendly, a way that made it a little more obvious what was happening and the results were um, sort of very easy to see and in this case to feel. Okay. So that's ice, okay? We got melting ice. You can do that whether you have snow around or, or you, you don't. You can just, again, have a sort of a freezed, a, a frozen uh, tray. Now, let me come back to here. Flipping all my little cameras around. There we go. 
All right, so I want to know, how likely are you to use something like this ice sculpting in your classroom? Um, is it something that, uh, you know, you, you, you probably won't use? Or is it something you're thinking about I I'm including into uh, your winter? Great. Looks fantastic. So again, be completely honest. You will not hurt my feelings. It's really important, especially because we've got spring and summer coming up. I want to know what sorts of activities are really resonating with you um, as teachers in the classroom. All right. So while you're thinking about whether or not you're going to be melting ice with your uh, very messy paint uh, paste, I want to talk a little bit about books in the classroom. Because again, I'm also a, a reading specialist. Books, I love books. And there are so many books out there about winter and about all those great things. So of course, I want to talk about nonfiction books. Nonfiction books are really important because of course, they're the way that, you know, we, we learn sort of that content. But I might be a science educator, but nonfiction books are actually not my favorite kind of book to use in the early childhood uh, center because they're great for learning like the, the content and the pieces. They're not so fun to read out loud as a group and to experience as literature. So there are some places that I like to put nonfiction books. All right, hold on one second. Looks like a lot, most of you are, are, are interested in using this ice sculpting activity. Fantastic, that's good to know. Thank you for that information. So I like to put nonfiction books, not front and center at story time. I know I'm a science educator. I should wanna do that sort of thing. But um, I like putting nonfiction books um, in places where students can sort of peruse them on their own. So in centers, I like to send them home because parents like to talk about the nonfiction books. They, they like to share what they know about a particular topic. They're my favorite types of books to send home for book lending. Um, and using them as supplements to story time, not so much trying to shoehorn them into the story time. I know we, we, we think that the, we're doing our best because we're, we're, we're putting the, the content front and center, but I'm telling you, it's okay. You don't need to worry about it. We can read nonfiction books about science and still get a lot of the content there. So how do you choose books? Oops, I got a little mixed up there. Um, so illustrated books, books with photos, offer both whenever possible. Um, I know a lot of people like the, the photos because it's, it's things the students may not have seen, but students definitely will respond really well to those illustrated books too. So make sure you have a, a, a mix of both. Look for diagrams, arrows, numbers, time lapse. You don't know what's gonna resonate with your students. So try to offer a, a great um, array of different types of nonfiction books that have different types of um, information, including things that are graphed or, or, or time lapse, those sorts of things. Include books that are above the reading level. I know, I know, I know, but those books have the best pictures. Those books have the best diagrams. So if it's above your student's level, and in fact, I'm going to recommend one that's actually was is made for adults include it in your science center, send it home. Uh, you know, if you send it home, make sure you put a little note, like we don't expect you to read all of this book with your student, but that's where the best pictures come from. So, so definitely look beyond the preschool sections when you're looking for nonfiction books. And if there's something wrong, that's fine. Just cover it up with a piece of tape and write over it. Honestly, the kids are gonna remember what you wrote more than they're gonna remember anything else there because it sort of seems like, ooh, we caught them making a mistake and they love that. So uh, if you find a mistake in your book, don't throw the book away. Literally just tape over it and, and write the correct information. They're, your students will think it's amazing that they have you know proven it wrong and they'll remember that content way better than any other content. All right, ways to use nonfiction books. What I like to do with um, uh, young students is I like to just have a, a pack of post-its and sometimes I'll draw question marks on them, sometimes I won't, next to the um, nonfiction books in their centers. And what I'll tell them to do is anytime they've got a question about something, put a post-it on there. They can write their name on it if you want, but really what, what's nice then is in a small group, you can bring that book out and be like, well, someone had a question about this picture. Well, let's talk about this picture. And it's, it's a nice way for them to engage with the book without necessarily being um, with you or with another adult while they're doing it. I spies are fantastic, especially in uh, books that have lots and lots and lots of pictures in them. Those can be those uh, uh, older or, or above level reading books. Break out the I spy, fantastic use. It's just as if you were in nature, 
sometimes you can't be, you can use those same sorts of observation skills by playing I Spy with a nonfiction book. Make a classroom documentary. This is adorable. This is a really fun one you can do with um, parents as well. They can they can record sort of um, you know a home a home entry in a documentary or encyclopedia based on the topic that you're working on, and then give them complementary images to cut to draw on if they're laminated. All that great stuff. Different ways to to um, interact with the um, content of these nonfiction books. So. I want to let me go to my next one. There we go. So just some great suggestions of some nonfiction books uh, that are perfect for the winter time. Um, so across the top there are just some some wonderful books that have great pictures, some are illustrations. Um, but the bottom here, I have three books that I sort of wanted to highlight for you a little bit. So The Story of Snow, right down here. Um, that one's great. It has fantastic diagrams. You can see sort of this diagram of how a snowflake forms is fantastic. Lots of questions. Um, are, are, you, can, you can bring up lots of questions and lots of things to talk about from just that diagram alone. And then these last two books are um, mostly books of photographs of snowflakes. In fact, the snowflakes and photograph book over here, W.A. Bentley, there's actually a children's book about him uh, talking about how he did so much to take photographs of snowflakes. But this book is amazing. It's got such beautiful um, up close images of snowflakes that I think are gonna really inspire your students to, to draw or, or, or make their own. And The Secret Life of a Snowflake here actually has some built-in crafts with it. It has um, like how to make a snowflake, which I know for some of the younger kids may not may not be the 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 thing you're looking for, but older kids can definitely practice their scissor skills on making snowflakes. So Secret Life of Snowflake has great photos and they're color photos. So you can see sort of the faceting that happens in the snowflake, fantastic book. And then it has those instructions on how to make a really great snowflake. All right. <clears throat> So now it's time to get messy. So the <laughs> the um, uh, paste was was definitely a little messy, but it's a great way to experiment with melting. But um, now I want to talk a little bit about how to really get to uh, inquiry exploration in your classroom and, and how to sort of minimize the mess because it is a little messier. So I, I, I think about science experiments in two different ways. So there's the inquiry experimentation, which I'm going to be talking a lot about. And then there's sort of the step by step. Now, these are the ones that you probably remember doing in high school. Basically, they gave you step one and step two and step three, and everyone were, were, was doing the same steps, coming up with the same answers. There is, of course, value to that, especially in preschool. It's, it's good to learn how to follow directions and order of operations, cause and effect, all that great stuff. Um, but I like to see a lot more inquiry explore, exploration in, um, in, in preschool. So when I say inquiry, I mean that we're we're spending more time sort of letting the students guide the experiment because in science that's what happens if you need to discover something about a new species of sea slug no one's going to tell you well first you do this with the sea slug and then you do that with the sea slug and then you do that with the sea slug no you've got to come up with the steps to figure out as much as you can about this sea slug i wish i had picked something easier to say than sea slug but here we are <laughs> So um, getting students sort of primed for that um, behavior to really think about how, what do I want to know and how can I find it out, that's at the heart of inquiry exploration. That's really what we want to do. And now in preschool, it's hard because you've got a whole bunch of students and if we sort of set them free and say, you know, what do you want to learn and how do you want to do it? It can be very overwhelming. So I'm going to walk you through um, sort of a, a, an inquiry um, experiment that you can do in your classroom. It can be modified in lots of different ways. Um, but I, I want to sort of show you sort of how I think about it and how I sort of um, uh, scaffold it to make it a little bit easier, but still get to that heart of, of inquiry exploration for preschoolers. All right, so we're going to talk about snow. 
We're not really going to talk about snow, though. It's a little deceptive here um, because really we're using snow sort of as the um, inspiration for just a general sort of hands on um, inquiry exploration of um, things that are sort of like snow. OK, so you'll see lots of things on here. You can use whatever you feel comfortable with. If you can't use food for science experiments um, in, in your center, choose something else. If um, you're like, I don't have Insta Snow or I, you know, powdered milk grosses me out, it grosses me out a little bit too, uh, you don't have to use those. You can choose any number of, of um, different substances because the important thing is, is we're gonna be experimenting with lots of different snows and the students are gonna get a chance to um, sort of lead the experiment. So let me stop sharing and I'm gonna come over to um, my other camera and then we'll take a look at this experiment here. So I'm gonna move my ice out of the way and you'll notice that I have just sort of bowls of white stuff. Let me raise it up a little bit here. I got bowls of white stuff, okay? Ideally, what you would do is you would start by, you know, talking about snow. What are some of the, the, the things that you know about snow? And you're going you're gonna to notice that it's white and it's cold and it's wet and all of those great things. So why we're doing this experiment during winter is these things are all, they share things in common with snow. <laughs> but really, the whole point of this experiment is to take a mystery to... Um, to take a mystery and to sort of take ownership of solving that mystery. So the students will be able to choose which of the snows they, they want to um, investigate. Now you can modify it, you can only give them two options and half the class can choose one, half the class can choose the other. If you wanna give them lots of options, like I have five options here, it's up to you, whatever sort of feels manageable for you in the moment. But the important thing here is that they get to choose their own mystery snow. Okay, now what's really important about that is what happens after the experiment. Why, why I um, encourage you to let them choose their own. It, after the experiment, we're gonna see a lot more learning going on. So just sort of keep that in your mind here. All right, so um, let me go back to my camera here. So we've got all of these sort of bowls of white stuff. Now, just so you know what we're looking at here, this is um, uh, potato flakes. I have sugar. I have uh, sort of um, torn up paper towels. I have cornstarch and I have Insta Snow. Now, if you have not messed around with Insta Snow, it is super fun. It is a blast to play with. So I'm gonna show you a, another way to use Insta Snow a little bit later, but I've included it in my um, uh, snow exploration because it, it is a lot of fun to sort of see. So the first choice is, which snow do they want to investigate? Now that's not the only choice they're going to have, but let's start with that one. So you may remember from um, last, if you were with me last time, I love these dry erase uh, pockets. We used them for dissection mats last time. Today, we're gonna to use them as a way to sort of organize our um, experiment. This is one of the ways that you can sort of manage um, different students doing different experiments. So you'll see on this side here, I have a big magnifying glass. It's just on the inside of my paper here. Now, if I chose A, you know, so I, you can choose A, B, C, or D. You don't wanna tell them what they are. That's part of the fun. Okay, so I chose A as the snow that I wanna investigate. And then what I'll do is I'll take a tiny piece of tape. I can't, oh, here we go. Just regular old scotch tape. And you want the students to take a real close look at them. So I would just take the scotch tape and then I would stick it to my paper here. And now I have a little sample of my um, uh, mystery snow. So I would look at it. I would use my magnifying glass. I'd take a really close look. And then here on my uh, magnifying glass, I would just draw what my um, mystery snow looks like. So everyone will do that. And of course their pictures will look a little bit different because the potato flakes look very different than our um, sugar and they look very different than our uh, paper towels. So that's the first sort of thing that allows you to, to have deeper conversations. 
because if we were we're all doing sugar or we were all doing instant snow, our drawings would all look the same. And that's not how science works. Scientists have to learn from each other. And the best way to learn from each other is, is to have different experiences and come at a problem from a different way. So even from these observations, from, from using our eyes to look at these pieces of snow differently, we're now able to share that information better because we're not all doing the same thing. All right, so the first step is to make observations. Now, depending on your comfort level, you can let your students touch as well as smell um, the, the, the different uh, types of food, I mean, different types of um, snow. I wouldn't have them taste even if they are edible because that sort of sets a weird precedence in your science center. Now there will be times you wanna use your sense of taste, of course, but mystery powders is not a time that we wanna <laughs> we want to encourage that. So we'll use our other senses. We'll use our eyes, we'll use, we can even listen to them. You can put them inside of a can and shake them up and do they sound different? If you're using white beads or um, that sort of thing, it will sound different than say cornstarch inside of a can. So there are ways to use Use your sense of hearing, but you're going to make your recordings on this little paper, uh, this little uh, magnifying glass here. That way, everybody can share what they've learned, and you can use the little tape trick just so you're looking at a, at a small portion of it. So that's sort of the first step: making observations. Really, really important. Um, here, hold on. Let me come back here and let me show you some examples of questions that you could ask to sort of get your students thinking about the snow. So if they, if you give them the option of having, uh, you know, two or three snows to, to, to observe at the same time, you can have them compare them, or you can just look, look across the pictures that everyone has drawn of their, um, of their particular snow. And you can say which snow has the largest pieces, which one has the most pieces. Now pieces is not a technical science term, but again, we're, we're not talking, we're not really learning about snow here. We're learning about the scientific process. So you don't wanna say snowflakes because they're not really snowflakes. So I think pieces sort of covers it. When we talk about snow, real snow, we talk about the pieces being individual snowflakes. But here, of course, it's not real snow, it's our mystery snow. So you can touch it and, and, and see if things change. You touch them, you can smell them. And of course, like I said, you can put them in a closed container. All right, <clears throat> so now comes the really fun part you need to set up an experiment. Again, experiments in preschool, when we, we're, we're talking about actual science experiments, are usually those sort of step-by-step -step recipe experiments. And again, they're great. But for this one, I want you to really, really try to let the students decide how to do this experiment. So they've already chosen the um, mystery snow they want to investigate. The question that everyone has to answer is, how does the snow change when water is added to it? Now, it doesn't sound like there's lots of options there. We all have a snow and we're all adding water to it, but there are lots of ways you can let your students sort of take control of the experiment. For example, they've already chosen the type of snow they wanna use. They can choose to add cold water or room temperature water. Will that change the, the outcome for most of the snows? No. It, it, it may not, but you know, something may dissolve more quickly like salt in warm water than it would in room temperature water. So there are things you can learn just by changing the temperature of the water. They can choose to add water to the snow or snow to the water, because that definitely could change the outcome of the experiment. They could add ice cubes or ice chips or crushed ice to their experiment, or they can add liquid water and ice and, and, and ice to their um, snow to see how it changes with the water. They can drip water on with an, eye with an eyedropper or they can pour it on with a cup. They can stir or not stir the snow. All of those are choices that the students can make. Now you may want to limit them depending on sort of your individual classroom. You may say, well, you can choose to either add an ice cube or you know just um, room temperature water or drip it on or those sorts of things up to you. You can you can sort of um, change the experiment or you can leave it really wide open. Really wide open, especially with sort of our, our um, pre-K students. You'll be surprised by how much they can learn and how excited they are about the experiment when they get to make those choices. Now, I want to show you a way to sort of um, 
organize that chaos <laughs> because it is a bit chaotic when, um, you know, it, it's much easier if we all had the same scoop of instant snow and we were all adding water to it at the same time, it'd be sort of very easy to control. So I, I wanna give you some sort of tips and tricks to help control the chaos that might ensue when we have students sort of choosing their own adventure when it comes to something like this. So I wanna come back to my camera here so you can see, you know, I've, I've got my, my letter A here and I've got my drawing of what it looks like. If I flip this over, here's a way to sort of organize what you do. What I've done is I've sort of just really quickly made a bunch of cards, okay? And, you know, some of the cards have little ice cubes on them. Some of them have hot temperature on them, that sort of thing. So the students can sort of organize their thinking. Well, I want to add it with an eyedropper. I don't want to pour it on. So they add a little eyedropper. You just sort of stick it inside the pocket. Okay. So it stays there. And I want to add cold water. So I'm going to put my cold water in there and I don't want to stir it. I just want to, I want to stick to just adding the water to it and see what happens. And then they can go do that. They, they have, they've created their own sort of steps to follow. And um, when it comes time to share what they've done. So if you really want to uh, uh, keep the mess sort of low, they can mix it all up in a little baggie and then you can just tape the little baggie to this, this little uh, uh, pocket here. And that's sort of an easy way to keep it all together. So not only do they have steps to follow, but when they go to report what they've learned to the other students in the class, they can say, well, I did snow A. You can see I wrote snow A down here. You can see the little A. So I know exactly what snow I used. And my snow A, when I added water by a um, eyedropper that was cold and I didn't stir it, this is what it looks like. So someone else may have also done A and maybe they added an ice cube and they didn't do it the way you did it. And the results are different and that's huge. Okay, that's a big deal because they're able to share the excitement of, of learning something and um, they didn't all learn the same thing. They're able to collaborate and like, oh, well, maybe next time I should add hot water to mine or maybe next time I'll try a different snow, but do the same thing because maybe, maybe it'll expand differently or it'll dissolve differently. Um, so again, we're not really learning about snow in this particular activity. We're really just sort of exploring inquiry um, learning and, and really taking charge of the scientific process, which again is very intimidating in preschool because there is there are big messes and it's hard to control. So hopefully um, I've, I've inspired you to, if you don't do this particular experiment, um, giving your students a little bit more um, say in, in how science works in their classroom pays huge dividends. We are really, really creating little scientists there. And we see it. We see little scientists do, we see the gears turning when they're playing and doing all sorts of fun stuff. Um, but uh, we, we, we often don't translate that to a science experiment. We sort of give them the step-by-step -step cookie cutter recipe experiments, which are great for learning content, but we, we don't let them sort of use that wonder and that excitement to, um, to, to create their own science experiments. So hopefully that is something that you feel a, a little more comfortable about doing in your own classroom. Speaking of, are you comfortable doing this in your own classroom? <laughs> How likely are you to mess around with snow in your classroom? Again, it's not so much about the actual snow, it's about messing around with experimentation. All right, while you're thinking about how messy you wanna let your, your, your classroom get with things like uh, Insta snow and, and cornstarch and water and all that great stuff. Oops, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about fiction books. I love using fiction books for science concepts. Okay, they're amazing. Um, I, I mentioned this last time. Um, I am. Uh, I worked for a. I worked for the Academy of Natural Sciences, which is a dinosaur museum. And of course, we spend all of our time talking about the really serious science of dinosaurs. And my absolute favorite book was a book called Dinosaur Farm. And in this book, we have a farmer who's taking care of dinosaurs. 
people and dinosaurs didn't live at the same time. So like that was a big no, no, but I pushed to use this book because there were so many great talking points in this sort of fantastical story about dinosaurs. And that is why I love using non, that's why I love using fiction books for um, actual real science content knowledge. The most important thing is realistic settings. Um, and you don't necessarily need to have realistic characters. I don't care if the bear talks. It doesn't matter if the bear talks. If the bear is living in a forest where you can talk about the ecosystem and the trees and all of those great things, it doesn't matter if he talks to you. So don't worry about those sorts of things as far as um, uh, talking about science content. The, the, the setting is a lot more important. And I like to look for characters that are really good at doing the things we want scientists to do, which is asking questions or you know searching for solutions or, or researching things. I love when, when uh, characters will go to the local library or will go to their teacher and ask a question to get more information. Find those books. But of course, pick the fun ones. You know what the fun books are. And speaking of very fun books, I want to share some of my favorite fiction books. So across the top, we've got some great ones, some classics. We got The Snowy Day. Um, and of course, we got books about animals because animals in winter, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit, um, is one of my favorite topics when we're talking about um, um, seasons. I love talking about how the animals adapt to the seasons because we love talking about animals. Um, but I highlighted these three books down here at the bottom because I, I want to talk about um, using books like this to uh, uh, frame a whole conversation. So all of these books, Brave Irene, Tracks in the Snow, and Lemonade in Winter, all fantastic books. But as you're reading them, I, I, I encourage you to talk to your students about how the books would be different if it was a different season. Okay, could you have any of these books? Would the story change appreciably if the seasons were different? And the answer of course is a lot. Of course they would change a lot. We can't follow tracks in the snow if there's no snow. So, um, you know, how could that story happen maybe at the beach? Could it happen at the beach? Maybe it could. So I, I, I like the idea of sort of flipping the flipping the story a little bit, especially when we're talking about winter and talking about how the stories would change appreciably if we change the season. So the last thing I want to talk about as far as fiction books go is in winter, there are some fabulous no word or wordless books or, or, word, or books with um, limited words in them. You're probably familiar with The Snowman by Raymond Briggs. It's a very, very um, popular uh, winter book without a lot of words in it. And then uh, Cat on the Bus is a really sweet a winter book too that also has very few words in it. But I wanna share a, a, a little bit of this book right here, okay? It's a book called The Red Sled. And it's not a truly wordless book, but I'm gonna show you a little bit about what makes this book so special and why I, why I particularly love it. And maybe it'll find a place in your, um, your winter story, your, your winter, um, uh, lessons too. All right, so we got this adorable picture, of course, adorable kids in snow. Who doesn't love kids in snow suits? But what I want to show you a little bit is the only words in the story are um, sort of onomatopoeia words or um, exclamations. So this first page is so great especially if you're in a place where um, students don't have a lot of experience walking through snow. It, this is perfect. The scrunch, 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 scrunch. As a student, is, as, a, as the child is walking through the snow is a perfect way to talk about sort of that feeling of walking through the snow and the sounds that happen when you walk through the snow. And I love this book because you'll see that the, the words start really big and they get smaller. And we can talk a little bit about how the, the person's walking away from us and that's why they're getting smaller. So this is really just a charming book that um, gives you sort of those um, different touch points to talk about things like walking through the snow or the animals that are in the snow. So we've got the, the um, bear sledding down the hill with the rabbit and we have sort of their reaction to it. Um, and it's, it's a great story to really sort of think about the emotions and the sounds, and the, the feeling of being in the snow. Um, it's one of my favorites and I, and I hope you can, you find a spot for it in your uh, winter lessons as well. 
Okay, so let me come back to here and let me share this again. All right, so let's talk about animals in winter. Okay, we've got a little bit of time left and I, and I wanna show you um, uh, some of the neat ways you can talk about animals in winter. We all know about hibernation. That is sort of our favorite topic to talk about in winter as far as, as, far as animals go. So I know you are doing fantastic dramatic play all the time, all year long, um, but to sort of add a little bit of sort of a wild winter feel to your um, dramatic play areas. There are great ways to talk about animals in the winter by put, setting up basically a den in your classroom. Anything can be a den, it doesn't matter. So you'll see here on the picture that I have a, um, one of those open-sided beach shelters. They're fantastic. I love them. If you can get someone to donate one of those to your classroom, they're amazing because they don't have sort of the, the, the uh, blockage that you would see in a normal tent. So you can sort of keep an eye on everybody. Um, but it does feel special and different enough um, to sort of like lend the, the lend itself to those interesting conversations. You can see here that this one was actually set up for a summer um, event that I did and a, a, a summer lesson that I did. Um, we, we stuck constellations up on the, the, the top of the, the tent and we, we lit them up with some black light and that was very, very fun, but it works great for a den too. So if you can get someone to donate one of those to your classroom, do it, they're amazing. Add a play tunnel to have a sort of a fun entrance for this for the students to enter. Don't overthink it. <sighs> Pinterest is so beautiful and has so many wonderful bear dens. I, I was just like, I, I scrolled through so many adorable bear dens. Do not let it overwhelm you. <laughs> Do not let it overwhelm you. Any Um, if you have outdoor space, do it outside. It's huge to be able to do this dramatic play outside, especially in the winter. Encourage families to do it at home and share with you. It's a great way to sort of bridge that um, home and, and, and school sort of gap there. Some tips and tricks. Bring the outside in, open the windows. That way it's nice and cold when you're playing inside your den. Put some soundtracks on, use natural materials whenever you're po whenever possible, but really open the windows. It's the easiest thing to do. And then it makes it nice and cold in there. So it feels like you need to crawl into your den. Give options. Now this is, this is where I tend to have a lot of fun with it. Give human options. So we spend all this time worrying about like, you know, do we add leaves? Do we add, you know, those, those beautiful little log pillows that I have in my picture there? Those are great. But if you add human things, things a human would need if they were settling in for the winter, you encourage sort of more thoughtful conversations. You can be like, well, a bear doesn't have a sleeping bag. What could he use? And it's a really easy way to sort of make those comparisons between what they're familiar with, the human side of it, and then what the animals might need. Um, and then this is just my own little sort of like personal tip. Uh, if you ever want to get a lot of sleeping bags for kids, get body pillow pillowcases. They're just big enough for a kid to climb into. They're much cheaper than actual sleeping bags and they're much easier to store. You can see my little kiddos in that uh, picture there are, are inside those little body pillow pillowcases. They make fantastic sleeping bags. And then, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about this a little bit later about how different animals need different things in their den. So some animals need food for, for uh, when they either wake up at the end of the um, hibernation or even during the hibernation, some of the smaller critters need to eat. So think about bringing in places, bringing in pieces that will allow the students to sort of eat in their den. You can have snack time in the den if you're really adventurous. Um, and then uh, uh, also leave it up to the students. If you are gonna stay in the den, and all winter long, what would you need? And you'll get some really funny answers, no doubt. 
All right, so as I was talking about, there are different dens for different animals. It's sort of the science behind it. I'm not gonna read it to you, but across the top there, we've got all sorts of bear dens, which are very exciting. Those are the ones that we sort of are most familiar with um, and how bears build their dens, but bears aren't the only ones that have winter dens. Um, reptiles, so the first one on the, on the bottom left here, this little guy right down here is a uh, turtle. Uh, winter den. So that's where a box turtle would hang out uh, during the winter when everything sort of slows down. You can see a snake uh, winter den there. They're actually, they will um, winter together because so it's, it's much safer for them. And then we have our little chipmunks here. Chipmunks den, chipmunk dens aren't just a single hole. They've got to have places where they can move around because their bodies, can, they can't keep themselves warm enough just by sleeping. So they also have to have places to move around and to get food and all that great stuff. All right. So how to sort of play with animals in the snow in your classroom. I like to focus on the critters that don't hibernate because uh, obviously they're, they're doing a lot more than sleeping all day long. So once you sort of set up your um, uh, den, then you can spend a little bit of time talking about the critters that do not hibernate and how are they getting around in the snow? So let me show you some neat ways to uh, talk about animals in the snow. So here is that instant snow that I was showing you. It is a lot of fun. So I've got sort of uh, dehydrated instant snow right here, how you sort of get it in its uh, natural state. There's no natural state. It, it's, it's basically a, a type of plastic. It's the type of plastic that's inside, um, most of them are made from the same stuff that's inside diapers. So really absorb it. But what's neat about it, so I'm going to add a little bit of water to this sort of dry snow and you'll sort of see it. See it sort of mounding up there. Oh, and you can over add water like I just did. Now, there he goes. Instant snow is super fun. All right. A lot of fun to play with. But we're going to use our instant snow right here to talk a little bit about how different animals move around in the snow. Oh no, let me get, there we go, that's much better. All right, you can use for this experiment, you can use, or this, this activity, you can use um, plastic animals. I like to use these guys right here. They're basically just footstep. Um, they're just models of different animals' feet. And then we've got a cute little picture of them on the back. So right now I've got a caribou or reindeer, and then we've got its footprint on the back. I've got a fox, it's an Arctic fox. And I've got his little footprint here. And I got a mouse. All right. And we got his little footprint on the back here. Okay. And um, you can use, like I said, you can use like just standard plastic animals. You can even use pictures for this particular activity. Because really what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how different animals um, sort of move through the snow differently. So we'll start with you know, you can let the students, of course, make trackways however they want through our little snow. You can see the little mouse footprints across there. Very cute. But here's the deal about mice. Mice don't really walk on top of the snow very often because it's very dangerous for them there. So where do mice have to go? They actually go under the snow. So we're gonna hide our little mouse under there because that's what they're gonna do. They're gonna burrow under that snow. And then we've got our little fox here. Our fox walks on top of the snow. So he makes those little footprints across the top of the snow, but he can hear our mouse under the snow. So he'll use his feet to dig our little mouse out of the snow. All right. And then finally, there's animals who go through the snow, which is our, our little reindeer, a caribou here. So instead of walking gently on top of the snow, like a fox might, these guys are heavy and their feet are, are teeny tiny compared to the rest of their body. So they actually go through the snow and they push the snow when they walk through it. And what's cool about these guys is the second reindeer will walk in the same tunnel. Okay, so you can play with these animals the same sort of way the animals will walk through the snow, either burrowing under the snow, going on top of the snow, or pushing through the snow. And of course, these things are great for Play-Doh. So I've got my little Play-Doh right here all set up. I got on top of the snow, through the snow, under the snow. So you can even just push the footprints wherever they would go in the snow. Oh, I lost my, I lost my little... There you go, he pushes through the snow. So that you can always sort of keep track of where the different animals will walk in the snow. Neat stuff. 
Okay, so let me, because we are running out of time because I'm a talker and that's what happens. So let me come on back to the presentation here. I didn't know that about you, Holly. Do you like to talk? Oh, okay, all right, all right, Miss Leslie. Well, yes, we I'm, do. A I'm just so <laughs> and excited. Just, and I hope nobody leaves um, in the next few minutes because there's lots of questions that we're gonna have Holly address that have been coming in as she's been talking. Whoop. Okay, this presentation, you'll be able to see it and be able to see sort of this, this uh, information about what animals sort of travel under the snow, which ones travel through the snow, which travel on top of the snow. There's some great resources um, in, in the write-up for this activity as well. How likely are you to use these? Please let us know. Okay, all right, Miss Leslie, I made it, 4.59, look at that. I got through everything and we're we're really close to five o'clock here. Okay, what are some of those questions, Leslie, while we're filling out our poll here? Miss Leslie? Oh, I'm sorry, I had to unmute myself. That's okay. <laughs> so a couple of things that came up and obviously everybody's really attuned to this. You know, these, some of these activities are great. For example, the, the, everybody was excited about the cave, but how do we really do that in a socially distanced way? Um, and in some cases, people were really helpful in, in kind of answering each other yeah. on the spot. Um, so Holly, you might want to address that. Um, so some of this is, is difficult from a social distance way, especially when you're talking about using things like those cool stones, they're not going to have access to those types of things if they're doing it from home, that might be very difficult. Um, is that what we're talking about doing, working with students who are at home? Is that sort of what we're talking about here, Leslie? I, I think it's a, a combination of people kind of wanting to write, you know, can, can we do this virtually? Um, and then what will we do in our classroom if we are trying to keep our, our children separate? And I think, you know, the answer we've been giving during any of our presentations and our workshops, and we're, we've been doing a fair amount of them, is that we want to give you some ideas that maybe, as Holly said, but can be ad adaptable. Um, somebody mentioned, you know, have a couple different trays yep. so that not everybody's in the same tray. Um, and at the same time, I think we all are trying to uh, be optimistic that there will be a time when we are back in our classrooms and we are safe to be closer together. So some of these you might need to back pocket for, for when that day comes. And, um, you know, some you can just ad adapt as best you can. Um, I'm just going to keep rolling just mm -hmm. for the interest of time. Um, oh, and uh, there was a cool idea about, Holly, would it be better when you were doing the the experiment, the discovery of snow, mm -hmm. the mystery snow, if um, we use black paper? And I thought that was yeah. an interesting idea. You know, it would show up better. So some people are like really it. attentive and really, mm -hmm. you know, kind of engaging and, and giving each other great suggestions. Definitely. Um, interesting scientific question. What's the difference between snow and water? Put you on the spot there. Holly. Oh, um, well, the difference between snow and water is basically how the molecules line up. Um, so a, as you, uh, you know, either increase or decrease the temperature, the molecules will line up in different, different ways. And, um, when you look at snowflakes, uh, the molecules will sort of line up along that sort of six axis and you get sort of that, that, that shape that makes the snowflakes. Um, so that it's really just as you add in, and subtract uh, heat from water, it, it changes the way the molecules sort of sit together. Thank you. So yeah. just, just to, I'm gonna keep going and if um, Terry or Marilyn or Rob or Kathy from our team see any other questions that they'd like Holly to address right now, um, please jump in at any point in time. We did wanna share with you that a lot of the things that Holly did talk about today and some people were asking these exact questions will be available, are available on the Becker's website. So definitely Insta Snow, very popular item. As Holly said, we sell it in two sizes. So um, just go to our website, Google search Insta Snow. The dry erase pockets, which have so many different uses, which Holly has shown us um, also are available. And those polar footprints, the woodland footprints, and we have some other footprints. So they're, they're fun to use in all different seasons, indoors and outdoors. They're a great material. We always, um, recommend that you have your science journals on hand and other um, some other science materials that you see here. If you go to the next slide, 
just um, we want to share that we put together a all season uh, book set because we truly believe and Holly has convinced us that every season has a story to tell. <laughs> So um, if you have a resource room in your school um, and, and it's something that you can start to, this would be a good way to start your collection and then constantly add to and build your collection. We always, when we do these big book sets, we include nonfiction and fiction because as Holly said, they both play important roles. So um, this is a, a starting point for some of you. And... Look at that, March 11th, save the date. So Holly will be back with us. Uh, we're gonna get a jump start in March so that you'll be all ready by the time spring hits, even though March will probably end up with some massive snowstorm, knowing what March can be like in the Northeast. And then if you'd also like to save the date uh, June 3rd for a summer science series. Spring well, is all about those bugs. I'm so oh. excited, Leslie. Yeah, I, I mean, we know. Spring is my season. Bugs and dirt. I'm so yeah, excited. You're not going to be talking about worms, are you? <laughs> no, no, no. We've already done worms. Worms are past that. <laughs> done worms. So um, what we'll do now is we're just going to kind of look, give Holly a chance to look at the chat. Holly, I think somebody sent you a little inquiry on, in the question answer box about a friend of theirs that they knew that worked at the Academy oh. of Natural Sciences. So they wanted to know if you knew that person. <laughs> you can check that and sure, answer I'll definitely that. Do that. I can answer Everybody that likes to make those connections. Yeah. So thank you, Holly. I took a million notes. I love your <laughs> tips. I, I really did. You know, I, I just always learned so much. And and I couldn't help but think about um, the connection between what you were saying about what we really want to communicate to children about science and being a scientist and what mm -hmm. it's all about mm -hmm. and how we learn by trial and we might get to a, two different results that both work. Mm -hmm through different methods. And I, I couldn't help but think about the COVID vaccines. Yep. You know, look at the different COVID vaccines that have come out of all the work that the scientists have done. So there's not always just one answer, one path. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it has such relevance for, for reality in our world. Definitely, yeah. And, and unfortunately that's missing from upper elementary and, and high school science too, which is a bummer. But if we can start kids sort of thinking on their own path when they're uh, little, I think we'll, we'll all be better off. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm going to just kind of check out um, one last picture of my beautiful snowy scene. Oh, I'm so jealous. That. I, I know. And I hope everybody had time to enjoy their hot chocolate, their hot coffee, or their <laughs> beverage of choice. And uh, we so look forward to seeing Holly again uh, in just a couple months. A yeah. couple months, yeah. Just yes, a couple months. A couple months. So um, keep keep chatting. Um, yep. Holly can maybe just check the chat yep. and see if there's any other questions she can answer. Yes. So there were some questions about whether or not the Insta snow is cold. Oh. You use cold water, it definitely is. Ah. <laughs> it does become room temperature after a while. And again, you can add too much water and it basically becomes nothing. It just sort of looks like murky water. Um, but the nice thing about the Insta snow, if you leave it out to dry, it will dehydrate again and you can put it in a bag and you can use it again. So um, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a handy little product yeah. um, that you can use. D DIY diapers, huh? DIY diaper. I would not suggest that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I better stop while I'm ahead. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, so that was a question about that. Um, it, it, it can be very cold if you if you make the water that you add to it very cold. All right. Okay, thanks again. We'll let everybody just chat a little bit longer. Yeah. And um, good to see everyone. Yeah. Take care. Be safe.